that one gives you much, much longer predictive horizons if you need them. And uh, Igor Mezic got some data from CDC to predict the flu, or as, as long as they record the flu back. And he was actually, with this technique and the coupon analysis and the delay embedding, could actually predict the flu up to a year and a half in advance. So just imagine if you know a year and a half in advance that there is a flu epidemic coming, you know, you can do a lot about that. Without overfitting. Without overfitting. <laughs> yeah, exactly, without overfitting. Okay, so, is what? <laughs> you have to ask him. <laughs> okay, so these are just a few things, you know, speed up GPU, CUDA implementations exist. Uh, we have a parallel, a parallelized uh, version of it. If people are interested, these are the codes that we give away. They are fully MPI. Uh, incremental algorithms, of course, play into a role. Uh, you know, the, at the bottom, at the, at the core of the DMD is an SVD. So if we make that one faster, you make the whole thing faster. So incremental algorithm help a lot. Uh, L1 robustification, optimized DMD, total least squares. I, we only did least squares, but you can also do total least squares. Okay, so that one robustifies the things very nicely. Clancy has done some nice, Clancy Rowley has done some nice things about that. Of course, there's a blend with compressive sensing in time to beat the Nyquist criterion by factors of five or six. All that is possible. Spectral estimation has been thrown in. And then on the big data side, like I said, map reduced, uh, randomized algorithms, delay embedding, and then plenty and plenty of applications, balancing for control applications, links to other decomposition algorithms and constraints, and applications that more or less are everywhere in medicine, in epidemiology, coronavirus maybe, uh, imaging, video surveillance, uh, even finance, you know, trading schemes based on DMD. All right, so with this, thanks for your attention. Bernd. So I, I, I understand, of course, the Hopf formalism. So essentially, you can have a linear dynamics for probability distribution uh, from a nonlinear dynamics, but having a, a, a linear dynamics from the instantaneous state of a single trajectory is somewhat frightening because you're, with a superposition principle, you can construct infinitely many solutions and somehow, if but the inverse exists, yeah. uh, there needs to be infinitely... But, yeah. Uh, 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 many uh, uh, um, solution also in the dynamical systems and typically if you have a dissipative system you would ex you would not expect anything like that to happen yeah you w but the, the the superposition is actually in an infinite space right that's yeah. always the killer that gets you yes, but, yeah. but, but for the hope it, it's it's clear. Well, but the super, superposition but in the Hopf formalism means you superimpose trajectories. But the but Hopf, the Hopf formalism is in probability densities. Yeah, right? yeah, yes, and, and that, that makes that sense. One is but, but, but but here it's frightening. That one is related to the adjoint of the Koopman, the Frobenius Perron. Yeah, but, but, uh, so that uh, so so if 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 there is so a linear system, essentially which you can build from the instantaneous state. Where you have a mapping from so the you, inst you, you 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 need you need a sequence to get to get it right. It's not instantaneous. The dynamics flows into the decomposition. It's it's not. I, mean, I, I cannot do anything from an instantaneous snapshot. F for the data processing, yes. yes. But if at the end you have a linear dynamical uh, uh, um, um, system yeah. uh, in a higher dimensional embedding. Yeah. For, for, from, uh, for a non-linear dynamical system, mm -hmm. uh, this would mean that somehow the superposition principle in the, in, 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 in the linear system uh, would need to, to um, be transferred uh, uh, um, um, to, to the non-linear system. And it looks to me like this, yeah. this is very, very non-generic. So that's why I would never expect or rarely expect things to close. Well, I, I'm not sure about the closing. You know, th this was a simple example. Yes, yes. And, and you know, calculating the eigenfunction, at some point we have to break it off. We can only get the eigenfunctions that are actually expressed 
in our data sequence. If that mm. one is not rich enough, we probably make a truncation error and it's not closing up. But, but right? So there's a, okay. there's a residual space okay. that we never capture that is in our... This is from the data. But initially you presented some analytical examples. Yeah. But, in, uh, but I, I, I had two examples, one yes. that closed and one that didn't y close, yes, yes. right? Mm -hmm. So what, what is the... And so the, if, the if you have... If, if, if you have a dynamical system, a linear... If, it if has you can construct a linear dynamical system in a higher dimensional embedding from a non-linear dynamics in a lower dimensional system, that means in the higher dimensional system, now you can say, okay, I do a superposition of solutions. There are still solutions. Mm -hmm. Now, if the inverse exists, I do not know if it exists, but if mm -hmm. the inverse is, uh, exists, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. need also need to have some strange superposition. It's something which is frightening to me. Yeah. It's something which I would not expect okay. to be generic. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Thank you for the very nice lecture. Yeah. Thanks. Much nicer than the, the original paper of Kopman, which is already <laughs> a very nice paper, yeah. I must say. Yeah. yeah. It's an excellent yeah. paper. But something I don't understand. Maybe you were close to the, the, the same question I will ask. I have thousands of questions. I will take two. Yeah. First one, if you take Koopman, original paper, okay? Yeah. And you take a linear operator, yeah. okay? Then you can see Koopman two ways. Either you see Koopman as a linear functions on your space, and then the Koopman operator is just the, the, the adjoint of the original okay. operator. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or if it is definitely nonlinear, then it's an operator on the space of all functions. Yep. Okay. Which means that the dimension is it's infinite. Huge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I haven't seen in your lecture. Yeah. Well, because you take as dimension, finally, yeah. exactly the same dimension as before. Yes. So yes. your Koopman yes. operator here, yeah. your space of functions, has the same dimension as the original dimension. Yeah. And I was expecting yeah. it to be much bigger. Yeah. Well, it's the snapshots that make the dimensions. Right? Yeah. It's the snapshot. I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't use anything like a quadratic, like I used in the in the in the example, or cubic or something like that, right? So I, I use all the snapshots, and the snapshots actually encode all the observable dynamics that is in there. It's it's exactly like the Krylov method, where where you yeah, you you like span you 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 make a rich, you 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 encode the dynamics, all the relevant dynamics of a matrix in the way it acts subs subsequently on on your vectors. Okay, and if if can we measure the, uh, the accuracy then? Yes, with the with the residual. We have yeah, some yeah, yeah, somewhere yeah, yeah, theorem yeah, saying yeah, what occurs. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. Can I skip to yeah. the second question? Yeah, second question. Yeah. The original Koopman operator operating on space of functions yeah. has mainly a continuous spectrum. Mm -hmm. There is no point spectrum or yeah. Yeah. there may have some point spectrum, but it's mainly continuous spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Here you are in a way shrinking this continuous spectrum into point spectrum. The point is spectrum, it? Yeah. 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 That's, that's true. Okay, that's true. That's true. That's no true. question yeah, yeah. then. Yeah. It's, the, the data suggests that it's shrinkable, right? Yeah. This was yeah. My first yeah. Question. yeah. 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 We exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 You have presented a couple of examples yeah. for DMD for experimental flow. Experimental do flow means uh, it should be statistically irrepresentable, so the DMD should collapse with Fourier modes. Okay. Where 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 would you use uh, what do you see advantages of DMD? 
in comparison to Fourier, to Fourier mode, mode because, uh, because uh, the companion matrix is not well conditioned, so you need to do a couple of tricks which you well, have regularized to regularize it. But, but, but still, where, where would you say a DMD has an advantage over Fourier modes if you have statistically representative yeah. time resolved um, experimental data? Right. So I would say that the, the, two, the two is uh, DMD is actually a non-uniform uh, Fourier transform, right? So Fourier transform, if you, if you, if you take the number of snapshots, it has to be uniform in sampling and it's uniform in wave numbers, okay? Here, you, you, you basically have an, a, 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 a maximally non-uniform Fourier transform given the number of data points. Okay, and because of that one, that's the advantage number two, you have hardly any spectral leakage. Right. So if you have, if for example, if you have, if you have vortex shedding, and for some reason you, you get one and a half periods of vortex shedding, you know, if you fully transform that, you get all kind of broad, broad peaks from, from the cutoff. Here, it actually fits a sign, no matter how incomplete it is, and it's very, very sharp. You know, yeah, your yeah, half cycle works too. It's, it's a little bit pushing it. I think two thirds or so is, is, is as, as, as daring we were, yeah, but, but you can hardly get any spectral leakage. Yeah. Uh, maybe I have also one yeah. question um, concerning a bit, uh, in I mean, let's say in line with the questions that were asked before. Um, what do you think about the example that was shown by Professor Dozen? Why in that case, um, let's say you have two frequencies, so you need uh, four DMD modes, but then maybe your data is rank two, so it does not uh, let you take four DMD modes. So what went wrong in that case? Uh, I don't know. I would have to look uh, through that. Uh, um, I, would, I would say, you know, the, 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 you would need four, but you only give it two. If your data is of rank two, yeah. but has more than one frequency, because rank is not necessarily linked to frequencies. So rank two means that you have two POD modes, but they might have multiple frequencies, so they might call for multiple uh, uh, DMD modes, but the inversion yeah. does not allow you to get that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I would, I would have to look at We discussed yeah. this yeah. with some beers, yeah. maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. 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 Why should I use the um, DMD instead of the POD, which is the main? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's a different decomposition. Uh, so so one, one is decomposing into orthogonality in time, the other one is doing into orthogonality in space, for example. Uh, it's, 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 it's the way you break it apart. There is no orthogonality in this one, right? You realize that, you know, the, yeah. the modes are all non-orthogonal. Um, it's, it's a single frequency. It's not multi-frequential. If you if you do if you if you decompose a data set with PODs, uh, usually you know if you have some dominant Struhal number, the lower DMD mo uh, the, the lower PUD modes will come out in pairs, indicating that you have cosine sine relationship with 90 degrees of phase shift. But then the higher ones will pick up more and more multifrequential signals in time, and then it's all mingled up. So the DMD, by design, actually separates them out at the loss of spatial orthogonality. So each, each of these rows in the C matrix is uh, linked to a single frequency. It's a different way of breaking apart the data set. So if you have anything that has, that has some kind of a periodic component in it, uh, I, I would say DMD is a lot crisper than, than POD, especially if you want to go to higher modes. If there's more than one frequency in there, they get all mingled up in POD. But if you don't have anything that has distinct frequencies that stick out over some broadband, it, it, it's up to you how, do you how you decompose the data. You know, POD may work just as well. You can do so with classic DMD, then you have a bit of both. Also, yeah. Normality in the modes, good residual and frequency, a, a pureness in the frequency. That was the advertisement. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
I let him do that. I let him do that advertising. Yeah. Uh, you have a microphone behind you. Come in. Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, I was just wondering about the kind of SVD pre-processing step. Um, are you? Do you ever envisage or have you ever come across problems where because you do an SVD, you actually end up missing some, some dynamics because you kind of apply a filter to your, to your data set? No, because the cutoff is pretty high. Okay. Mm. The, the, the cutoff is, is more or less machine precision or 10 to the, 10 to the minus 12 or something like that. Okay. So, so if, if, you, if you, you know, pseudo inverses have, have thresholds, which is the same as, you know, the regularizing coefficient for a, a, a ticket of regularization or something like that. So, so um, you can tune in how much you, get, you can throw off. And if you tune in quite, quite high, yes, you can miss some, some, uh, some dynamics. But if you keep that one at, at uh, 10 to the minus 10 or something like that, and let the amplitudes decide what's important and not. So you overload the amplitude, the sparsity promotion part, rather than cutting off too early uh, that one is usually a, a, a pretty good strategy for capturing anything that is in the data. Thank you. The SVD is mostly for, for rank deficiency, to avoid rank deficiency. Yeah. It's not for cutting out things that you feel like are unimportant. The sparsity promotion is for cutting out things you feel are unimportant. Do you have a dream what you will <laughs> present in a follow-up version of our workshop in 10 years? I think it's time for a beer now. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't thought about that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Five years? <laughs> no. Two years? <laughs> How about tomorrow? How about tomorrow? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. No, no. Okay. So, so my, my, my dream is having the fastest learner to learn the Conmimo controller in the experiment with okay. very uh, um, um, few tests yeah. and, uh, and having also the fastest learner for a reduced order model and also uh, uh, having a, a good analy some analysis yeah. tool. All right. You're a lot more organized than I am. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks. Okay, so thanks very much for to Professor Smith. Thank you.